So I do want to invite and welcome everybody to the celebration of National Public Health Week. This is what happens, you know, a lot of people think the uh, tough weather is responsible for a lot of people not coming. In fact, what is really responsible is that we began National Public Health Week with my lecture on Monday night. And so a lot of people decided, that's it, I'm not going anymore uh -huh. anymore of these lectures. I do want to welcome everybody, though. I know we have uh, some other folks who are going to come in as soon as they can dry out and find the uh, campus. Uh, the old uh, story I used to tell is how I had this dream that I went up to heaven, and I discovered that just as I got to heaven, they were about to start a conference on one of my favorite topics, disaster medicine. And uh, they, you know, they asked me to give a lecture on floods and response to floods because of our experience with Superstorm Sandy here in the New York area. Well, I was all set to get up and give my talk, and there was a big audience. Somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, this is heaven and Noah is in the audience. So I was a little nervous because, you know, give a lecture on floods when Noah is in the audience is <laughs> kind of tough. We are not in that kind of situation tonight. We have a great speaker who has really, uh, I would say of all of the public health leaders in the country, he has arguably the most unique and, and most extensive sets of backgrounds. He can talk on almost any topic that would be of interest to us here in the public health program at New York Medical College. And we've been so fortunate since 2013 to have him as a member of our distinguished faculty, a participant in our public health practice council with all of the other uh, health commissioners and public health directors around the Hudson Valley. Uh, Dr. Eli Avila, who is not just a physician with an MPH and an MBA, but also with a law degree uh, and quite an expert in public health law, uh, is our speaker tonight. Uh, he just last night got a special award for leadership in public health from the SUNY Orange Foundation which was presented at SUNY Orange in Newburgh uh, yesterday evening. Uh, he is absolutely a moving target, so we're very fortunate to have him here tonight. Uh, currently, he is the ninth Commissioner of Health for Orange County, New York. He also served as the 26th Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania before this job. At that time, he was managing a $1 billion budget, a staff of 1,700 people uh, from of course, the extreme western to eastern parts of Pennsylvania, north and south, a very large state with a very large population. Uh, Dr. Avila currently manages the Orange County Health Department uh, with its uh, responsibility for almost 400,000 people uh, for a budget of $67 million uh, and a sizable uh, staff. Uh, those of you who are currently students, think ahead to after you get your MPH or DRPH with us, think ahead to some of the health departments where you may work in the future. And remember that whenever you meet one of our health commissioners, this is a potential future employer, as, as well as somebody. <laughs> and of course, in Orange County particularly, our school has a very long history of Orange County uh, employees from the health department getting their MPHs with us in one batter year. We had three graduates in just one year going back up to Orange County, but also it's been a great site for practical students uh, to go up there and learn a heck of a lot about public health, what I like to call public health at the retail level. Uh, since arrival in Orange County, uh, Dr. Avila was also appointed by the New York State Bar to the Committee for Mass Disaster Response. He's an active member of the public health law section, where he collaborated on three webinar, webinars to assist the New York State Legislature adapting legislation to conform to the merger of primary care and traditional public health under the Affordable Care Act. He also volunteers as the medical director for the Orange County EMS, and as I recall, you're also the uh, commander for the Medical Reserve Corps in Correct. Orange County, one of the original Medical Reserve Corps units in the United States, and a very well-developed one. He's assisted in creation of the current New York State Hepatitis C law. He's actively working on both Senate and Assembly bills 
regarding tactical emergency medical support. Uh, he had co-authored the Pennsylvania law on scheduling uh, drug homologs at the request of the District Attorneys Association and also has assisted in writing a similar law for the New York State District Attorneys Association. And so his career and his responsibilities really straddle in, in really an amazing and very unique way the public health, medical practice, and legal communities all to uh, implement his vision of a healthier population, healthier workforces, and healthier environments for all of us. So uh, he is somebody that I personally totally admire, and uh, we're really privileged to have him here tonight. In the interest of time and to give him the most amount of time to speak, I'm going to simply post this on the web, his full bio, and uh, you can read it at your leisure. So let's show a warm New York Medical College rainy night welcome to Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. And can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm going to try to walk you through some very interesting episodes that I've had in my career where I actually was at um, some pivotal points when it comes to health, public health, and the law, and society. And you'll think, those of you who've taken public health 101, you know, you were taught to, at least when I took it with Professor Landrigan at Mount Sinai in 2005, um, it was dealing with, um, for example, the most media. I call it dancing with the devil. You have to do it, and you have to be friendly, no matter how mean they are, how much the fake news is out there, you have to be able to deal with the media to make things happen. But it's not only that. I was brought through, since then, I've been brought through a career where I've had to deal with some really tough issues. I'm going to share some information. Some of the stuff you might know, but I'm going to give you the back information, the nitty-gritty, how things happened. Um, so you'll, you'll be hearing about it here, uh, uh, not so much in the, in the news. Uh, I'll start off with one of the first things that I did was I was the Chief Deputy Commissioner of Health Services for Suffolk County. That was my first career in public health. Steve Levy hired me. Um, he became a Republican so he could run against Mario Cuomo. We know how that went. So just before I left for Pennsylvania, I was tapped by Governor Lee Corbett. Um, the legislature had asked me to, they were having an issue. In New York, we have uh, licensing when it comes to supervision for tattoo artists. Pennsylvania, anyone can open shop, which is scary. But we have that here. But given, even though we have the regulations, we had an issue in that there was one particular company from Europe was selling the tattoo equipment to folks that aren't licensed. You know, those folks that are maybe 19, 20 year, old, 20 year olds, and even older than that, but they, didn't, they, they weren't licensed. They were doing out of basements. We were aware of that in Suffolk County. We had a few cases of hepatitis B. We had some, some major issues. So I said, you know, let's use long arm jurisdiction. And that means that you can set up a law where you can reach out. If you're gonna sell in my country, guess what? I'm gonna reach out and touch you if you don't do it correctly. And we have certain interests here. And what I did was, I wrote, this is part of the statute that I wrote before, just before I left, but basically letting them know in Europe and elsewhere, if you're gonna sell in Suffolk County, not New York, but Suffolk County, which is within New York, we're gonna go after you if you didn't check with the registry to make sure that person was licensed to be a tattoo artist. Pretty simple. And that gives you the ability to sue. The county attorney can go out there and do their job if someone does that, especially if there's a public health scare. But this is just real basic statutory language that you can put together, and you can do that in any county. If the state hasn't done it, uh, um, uh, because we're a home rule state, and you can get the job done and really protect the public. So that was some, my, one of my introductions to, 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 to health, and writing statutes. And I've, throughout my career, I've written at least 18 of course, the 18 bills, uh, Governor Corbett allowed me to interact with the legislature, executive, legislative branches working together. Doesn't always happen here in New York State. But I had the privilege of, of co-authoring 18 bills that were signed into law throughout my career, and they varied uh, quite a bit. Um, anyway, I was sworn in to, to, uh, to be the 26th secretary. Well, I was, you're acting when you first start. So on January 18th of 2011, I was there for at the inauguration, they swore in the governor. Federal judge comes in, temporarily swears us in. That's how it's done. Um, because you have to then go through the confirmation process, which ends in May. The PA is very much like, a, like the feds. And the reason I say that is because my situation got really scary. 
Um, a year and a half before the abortion doctor, Kermit Gosnell, uh, Kermit Gosnell, the Philadelphia doctor from the Philadelphia Women's Medical Society, had been busted. They had gone to the DA, had gone in and found the pills that he was selling, the drugs he was selling. Then they found all the body parts. And you can go look at the movie that's available now on Amazon. Um, it, it's called three, uh, 3801 Lancaster, colon, American Tragedy. Um, but anyway, that happened a year and a half before. On Inauguration Day, people weren't very happy with the new governor. The grand jury report was released. So on the 19th of January, it's all over the papers. We haven't even moved into our offices yet. So then on the 20th, I get called to the governor's office. And I'm literally, the governor's here, and I'm here. And he says, Dr. Avila, I mean, I was one of, there were only two of us who were not Pennsylvanians on the governor's cabinet. He says to me, Dr. Avila, I hired you because you're a physician and an attorney. Um, I need your help. And governors don't rarely ever say, I need your help. You got to help me with this. And I turned to him and said, don't worry about it. I've been briefed by my staff. I uh, want to let you know we've got an issue dating back 25 years, which encompasses both Democratic and Republican governors. Um, I'm going to do my best to ferret it out and find out what's going on. So the criminal investigation was going on, but what did we do about the 22 other abortion facilities in the state? And what I had to become aware of was we really didn't have, we had regulations, but they were really wimpy regulations. You couldn't really find folks for what they were doing. Um, so as I just promised me one thing. That's just, I know that you are pro-life. Do not make this a pro-life or pro-choice issue. Make this about the health, the well-being, and the dignity of the women in Pennsylvania. And there's one, more th one other thing. Make sure the commissioner of the state police reports to me on this and the Secretary of State. I said that because I knew that Secretary of State, unlike New York, they're the ones that license the professionals in PA. So they set me off and I even got a detail because it, it was pretty dangerous. And throughout my research, I even reviewed the autopsy reports from Philadelphia um, and, and, and studied some of the, uh, the, the, when you have, you can tell if someone's uh, fetus is taking a breath, if the, the lungs float in water, you know, if they, if they have it, they'll sink. So they hadn't taken that first breath of life. So I had reviewed the autopsies and I went to visit many of the, um, uh, of the facilities. Now the issue was I wasn't confirmed yet. And I, they had already set up Senate and, uh, and House of Representative meetings. Uh, 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 I had to testify. And my, my first, uh, the governor's attorneys were really concerned that I might say the wrong thing and eventually not get confirmed. And that would not be a good thing. I said, don't worry, I got it. We're going to do exactly what needs to be done. I guess just being a little cocky from New York. Um, but I, I went ahead and the first, the first meeting, the first testimony, it was packed with folks that had the babies in the... Uh, the fake babies in the coffins behind me. And I don't know how this happened with all the tight security. Someone hit the power to the Senate hearing room. People, the senators ran off screaming from the stage. And I'm sitting there like this. And the security police came and picked me up and said, we have to go, uh, Mr. Secretary. So they escorted me out. An hour later, they brought me back in. Everything was fine. Someone actually would, would, had caused that scare. So I sat there and I testified. And, I, and I, my testimony, if any of you are on LinkedIn, uh, my testimonies up there is one of my projects. I had reviewed, found out that for 25 years, the governors had said, do not inspect the abortion facilities, both Republicans and Democrats. And I said, that can't be. You have to, you have to uh, deal with these issues. And I reported that on my first visit, and this was one of the abortion facilities, was down the block in the governor's mansion. I arrived, and in the exam room, the paper towels were on the floor. So that meant the physician would wash their hands, pick up the paper towels from the floor, dry their hands, and then see the patient, right? And I couldn't cite them for that the way the regs were. Also, I opened up the, the trays and you have the sterile packs. Well, these packs that were supposed to be sterile had sheets of fungus growing on them. Some of them, I even pictures had, I said, you can't use these speculums, they have wood parts to it. They belong in a museum. You can't sterilize a speculum that's got wood on it, right? So. That was just the beginning. Another one that I went to, we would do it randomly. I would have uh, state police in plain clothes escorting me, and it would be a surprise whether it's Pittsburgh, anywhere around. And there were 22 of them. And I reported this. There was one where there were so many pills that were opened by you know, the public and pads, doctor's pads that were pre-signed for narcotics. 
I said, no one's leaving. I called the state police in, I called the secretary of state, said, they're gonna be arrested here. And some people were arrested because yet again, they were selling pills from this one particular abortion facility. So I gave my report. I said, I'm gonna be writing the regs. So what I sat down, I had 21 attorneys working for me. I sat down, we wrote the regs. And guess what, by December, they had passed. We finally had regs in Pennsylvania for abortion facilities, very much akin to the um, ambulatory surgical facilities. And this was important. How can you be the fifth largest state and not be able to find or regulate some of these facilities? And um, this was the, the this, that's Dr. G uh, Gazna. And by the way, his office, this Philadelphia Women's Clinic, was two blocks away from the Philadelphia precinct. There was a separate entrance if you were a person of color, if you were not a person of color, there was a schedule of uh, levels of anesthesia. The poor folks had, uh, uh, many times couldn't afford the anesthesia, so the abortion was done without any. It was a sliding scale. This was going on. I, my, my, my feeling was, this has been going on for so many years, obviously powerful people had abortions done there because it was just being ignored by the police in Philadelphia. It wasn't being taken care of. Um, this was the, the actual, see, December 22nd, it was accepted. Now, some folks decided, and in public health, you'll, you'll notice this, um, we have regulations. They wanted to make new construction, but they didn't realize, and those are folks that just want to shut down the abortion facilities, just get rid of them. I didn't, they didn't realize I had the power to veto that and say I'm giving you an exemption because I'm not about to widen stair, stairwells that were purposely being done by certain politicians so they could shut the places down like we here in Texas it happens so I still had a continuing role and I did get confirmed in May I was confirmed. I was traveling back from the CDC and I actually um, uh, got the notice that the news that I have been unanimously confirmed by by the Senate now next issue fracking as we all know fracking I mean it was a basically just take the land just rape it in, in, in Pennsylvania now, knowing that that was going to happen, I was then charged. Well, I was charged with coming up with a plan, and that only happened because the EPA complained to the lieutenant governor. I was at that meeting at the CDC. Uh, Tom Frieden had invited 32 of us. That that year in 2011, 30, there were 32 new state health officers. And when I was there during one of the breaks, this mysterious person, who was really eerie, comes up to me, does not identify herself, knows everything about me, and says you need to be testifying before the Senate. Uh, it's a sham what's going on in Pennsylvania. I said, what's your name? Don't worry what my name is. You need to do that. I arrived but, um, two days later back in Pennsylvania. I got a call from the Lieutenant Governor to be report to their office. And they are apologizing to me for not being on this special commission. They had no scientists on this commission on fracking. So it was my job to then testify. And I did, and I actually got some of the most liberal environmental agencies were so happy with me because I did the right thing. I talked about registries. I talked to, I asked the governor permission for $2.1 million for the registries. Um, you have to ask permission before you come up with the number. The governor's got to agree. And uh, I, I, I dealt with the Pennsylvania Medical Society to create courses. I had um, the EMTs ready to be trained to deal with the fracking fluid in these areas. So it was just, it was really bringing in a consortium of all the health stakeholders to be able to deal with the fracking. Well, guess what? At the midnight hour, my 2.1 million went out the window. And I guess I, I guess I had, even though I had created a nice balance between fracking and, 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 and keeping the public safe, it didn't work. And then, you know, the spin goes on at that point with the frackers, um, the, 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 the lawyers on, on how that's just not gonna work. He's just a lousy secretary. Meanwhile, I was trying to maintain a balance for both, for, for the folks. And it was a bit of a, felt like a bit of a betrayal when the governor, without letting me know, yeah, it's a 2.1 million that he had given me permission to request. So that being said, what was interesting is, this was known as Act 13. Ultimately, most of Act 13 was found to be unconstitutional. Uh, one section of the law found unconstitutional called the statewide rules on oil and gas to preempt local zoning rules. Another section required municipalities to allow oil and gas developments in all zoning areas. In other words, 
in the most pristine areas of Pennsylvania. You're paying your taxes there. An oil company could come in and say, we're going to frack you. And we're not going to ask you for permission. Thank God the courts, you know, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania thought pro appropriately. I still think that there can be a balance with doing fracking and having public health. They just, you just have to be really stringent on how you examine the triple coating of the, of the pipes that they use, the, 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 uh, the diesel fuels of the trucks that are in the area. You have to be sensitive about that. You can do the fracking, but you really have to have the registries and you have to be sensitive of the public that you're dealing with. So that basically, over the years, and this, this decision was not, to, in 2016, basically found, just dismantled Act 13 uh, as being unconstitutional. So that's, that was my issue with, 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 with fracking, and I had a very decent, in fact, the day after I testified before the Senate, Dr. Um, Nira Shah called me in my office and said, Eli, can we get together and discuss this because we have an issue in New York. I said, no problem, we'll go find a neutral state like Virginia. And we met there with along a few other states and we had discussions on so my plan is how you can do, have coexist with fracking and having, taking care of the public. You, you just basically have to get the community and the doctors engaged and make sure that the trade secret issues are dealt with. Okay, now this is gonna be somewhat interesting and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this on for you Here we go. Voter ID, which is going to allow Governor Romney to win the state of Pennsylvania. Done. <laughs> Voter ID is going to allow Mitt Romney to win Pennsylvania. Wow. There it is, folks. He's going to win because of Voter ID. That's the GOP game plan for this election. And now they've admitted it. Last month, I talked about Port ID with 93-year-old Vivienne Applewhite, a woman who marched for civil rights with Martin Luther King, but who now can't vote because of this new Republican law. I think that the reason that they wrote this ID and everything is because it's so many of the Black people that doesn't have ID, and I think it is because they don't want Obama in there. So I think they're trying to do something to keep the black people from having the right to vote. The state estimates there are 96,000 voters like Ms. Applewhite who could be turned away from the polls because they don't have valid photo ID. All the estimates put it much higher. In a tight election, that could be enough to make the difference. We just learned that too. The lawmakers have passed voter suppression laws in half a dozen critical swing states over the last couple of years. That's the backdrop. I'm sitting in my office on, my, on the eighth floor on the west wing. My lawyers are on the east wing on the other side of the corridors, except for my chief counsel. She comes into my office and says, I got the White House on the line. Uh, uh, Dr. Alfie, I go, really? Yeah, chief counsel for President Obama's on the line. I said, okay, I'll join you. So I walk over to her, to her office, and this was the issue. To get a voter ID card, if you didn't have a driver's license, you had to then purchase a birth certificate. Take that for $25. Take that birth certificate, the DMV, which had been exempt. They were, there was a special grant somehow they had gotten for them. And then you get the voter ID card. President Obama knew, wait a second, I'm not gonna deal with the governor. I'm not gonna deal with DMV. That's, he knew, and they knew, Vital records, where are they? Where do health departments come from? Water, safety, right? And also birth and death records. Where are the keepers, right? Vital records. They knew at the White House, it's this new guy, this New Yorker who's out in Pennsylvania, who's, um, who, who's gonna be taking care of this. So this was the message. Uh, the president is very concerned about the reelection in November. Um, he doesn't think he's gonna get a fair shake in Pennsylvania. 
Secretary Avila, we expect you to do something about it. The president expects you to do something about it. This is now 2011. I graduated from Mount Sinai with my MPH in 2007. Who knew? And I've been a lawyer for a while. I graduated from law school in 2003. Who knew that there would be a nexus of the constitutional right to vote and public health, vital records? I was living it. And what I told, and, to, and he's also concerned about the 41,000 birth certificate uh, requests that haven't been processed. They even knew that detail. I said, well, wait a second. That is something I inherited from Democratic Governor Rendell. So you can't blame me for that one. I'll try to take care of it. Tell the president I'm going to work on this. So I made an appointment to meet with the governor's staff. I said, look, let's go to the WIC offices where they get the voter IDs in the inner cities. I'll take my jacket off. I'll roll up my sleeve. Let's get, I want CEOs of every shape and color with me. Let's teach people how to fill these forms out. Oh, that sounds great, Dr. Avila. Never happened. So I said, oh my God, this is, this is, this, this is not going to play well. So I came up with an idea that would not disrespect the president or the governor. This is what I did. I said, I'm not charging $25 because that's a taxation on a constitutional right. I'm buying these cheap stamps that say for, voter, for voting only on the birth certificates, and we're giving the birth certificates for free. That's what I'm going to do. Number two, I'm going to appeal to my staff of 1,700 to do the right thing. So I sent out a message about how we needed to collect or review these 41,000 birth um, certificate requests. And why we needed to do it. And believe it or not, at I had all the records brought in from near Pittsburgh to my conference room, and I didn't use my conference room for almost five months. In four and a half months, we had processed all 41. People, my staff did it during lunchtime. They took the time to fill these out because they knew it was the right thing to do. So I had such a joy the day that I, I told my chief counsel, let's call the White House. So I called the White House, he said, will you please relay to the president that he's going to get a fair shake in Pennsylvania. All 41,000 um, birth certificate requests have been processed. And this is how I dealt with the issue of uh, voter ID. Now, I'm going to let you know, I grew up in Manhattan. I've seen voter ID fraud. I've heard people bragging about it when I was a little kid. And um, I remember asking my parents, what's voting? Asking my parents, I heard about it. I said, it happens. But in Pennsylvania, they didn't even have one case one example to give, it was found, that law too was found to be unconstitutional in Pennsylvania. They gotta at least have something for the court to, to be able to, 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 to have a claim. You have to have some sort of standing. And that didn't exist. But that was a way of figuring out, being in a tight spot, how do I not disrespect President Obama and disrespect my, my, my manager, the governor? I thought it was pretty creative, it worked. I, I like to share that with you because that fellow who spoke is actually a nice guy, but basically what they were really saying, I've met him, I know him. Guess what? Minorities aren't going to vote, so Romney's going to win. That was the message. How can you go out in public and say something like that, even if you are creepy enough to really think that? But this is with the backdrop. So an interesting nexus in public health that you rarely ever go through and I think about this all the time because I would never have thought, as an attorney and as a, as a public health student, I would never have thought that they, the two would ever meet. Let's see what we have next. Hepatitis C. Okay, that's me. I closed uh, 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 the, the bell at NASDAQ. It's actually on the skin. The skin of the building on 43rd Street is actually eight stories tall, and they actually had me up there for a while. So I'm looming over the west side of Manhattan. So, uh, and that's uh, um, the assemblyman Zabrowski. He, um, he's the assemblyman who took over his father's spot, who died of hepatitis C. That's his mother and that's his sister. And this is after I had left Pennsylvania. And I'm gonna go over some of the things that are important, why you have to listen in public health. And even when you're told, don't listen to the, um, uh, the commercial side. Because um, it, it can really lead to really changing public health. As a New Yorker, I always assume that you have mobile labs. I grew up with mobile labs. You check for, for HIV, you check for hepatitis B, C. You know, I even arranged for it in Suffolk County uh, when the state needed some help. Not in Pennsylvania. Didn't exist. It was this archaic also system of different lab requirements. Now, this was brought to my attention through the executive VP of Orishore. 
which is the company that does the rapid screening for hepatitis C. Some of my colleagues would say, oh, gee, you're dealing with industry, the pharmaceutical or medical device. They're evil. You don't speak to them. My attitude is, guess what? This is something known as commercial free speech. It's part of the First Amendment. I'm going to listen to what they have to say. And if it's good, I take it. If it's not, I just ignore it. I, I don't sell my soul for a slice of pizza because a pharmaceutical rep is speaking to me. I have enough pride in, 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 my, in, in my profession. So I, um, I was made aware of that. And I got very much on, I said, well, how do we deal with the issue? Then I was made aware of the labs. I started going to um, smaller um, health department conferences that normally the secretary doesn't go to. In fact, they were like, oh my God, the secretary's here. So I could hear, and I wouldn't leave. Even during the lunch break, I'd sit down just to hear what was going on, because I thought I was making some progress, and I realized I wasn't making progress. And so I, what I decided to do is, okay, how do we get the attention of folks? I put together Pennsylvania's first hepatitis C roundtable to give diverse thought leaders in government, the biopharmaceutical industry, medicine, and the grassroots movements. I got them all together. People don't normally speak. I had members of the cabinet there. And we did an all-day conference. And what I got out of that was the following. Declassification of the Pennsylvania lab certification into just one category of labs. I thought I had done a great job by um, uh, some, some of the things I had done. I realized I hadn't done that great a job. And I heard people complaining in the background. I said, gee, I need to do a better job. It's listening to your folks that are out in the field. Two, Rapid screening of HIV uh, and hepatitis C is a, is a, rec is a recognized standard in Pennsylvania. Um, the official recognition of mobile labs permitting to, uh, uh, permitting to afford statewide screening of both HIV and hepatitis C and B. What had happened was we were dealing with 1951 regs that thought labs were just brick and mortar. And when it said a doctor has to be available, well, they hadn't invented the cell phone yet. So the governor said to me, said, Secretary, just don't open up the regs, because that'll take years. Find a creative way. I said, I will. And I sat down with my legal staff, and we started thinking like lawyers. I said, well, we can just reinterpret. I'll send out a memo how I'm reinterpreting these regs. And that's exactly what I did. And then I got rid of all this stratification. I made it really simple on how to um, have mobile labs. So I could work with nonprofits, with religious organizations, and how to get things done so we could get moving. You don't wait for someone who's afflicted to come to you. You go out to the needy, and that's, that's just the way it is. Just like when someone who's been abused, you don't wait for them to come to report it to the police. You reach out to them when you hear about it. And that was missing in Pennsylvania. So, and then that went on for a few months, and then once again, I was invited to another meeting. Now that I was informed that some of the major groups didn't even know how to apply for the permits. I had made it so easy. So I did, went through a campaign, a public uh, 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 campaign on how on how to apply to get a mobile permit and have a mobile lab. So you can get all this great stuff done, but if people don't know while out there, the grassroots, you're not gonna get the job done. It's just not gonna happen. So you have to work, work, work it through from beginning to the very end. Put yourself from the very beginning to being the actual worker out in the field. And then, and then things work, because then everyone's informed. So I, went, I put in a, a campaign to let people folks know, it's a lot easier, we can do this in Pennsylvania now. Let's go help people. Now, that was done, but, and then I got invited to the Hepatitis C Day. And that's when I was at, you saw me on NASDAQ. I gave a two minute live speech encouraging other states. I had done a, a legal review of all the obstacles for mobile lab testing in every single state. And I said, okay, let me talk about this very quickly on how what we've done in Pennsylvania needs to be done in all the states. So I, I implored uh, uh, the other states to do that. I was, I was as part of ASTA, which is the group of all 50 state health commissioners and nine territorial health commissioners, I was able to give a talk. I gave my matrix, my legal analysis on every state um, so they could start working in their states to overcome these barriers for rapid screening as necessary. So that being said, after two years of being in Pennsylvania, being away from my family, I told the governor, it's been great, I'm going back to New York. I'm being a bad husband and a bad dad. I've, I've only seen my, my family one weekend out of the month. So I left and I came back, but I was made aware that there was a hepatitis C bill going on in New York. So I made it to the legislative day and that's the assembly from Rockland. His father, and I'm gonna say, cause he's very open about it, 
got a black blood transfusion years ago for a really nasty brain tumor that normally would kill you. Guess what? He survived the brain tumor surgery, but years later died from hepatitis C. How's that? And that's his wife. That's his son who took over who's a young attorney. And that's the sister. So I, I, I felt really welcomed as a former secretary to, um, at the legislative day in Albany, because I, I have a home in Albany. And I was able to speak to a lot of the senators. I got very much involved. And one of the things that I did was, I've been a police surgeon for a long time, ever since I graduated from law school. So I got the FOP, which has got 500 police surgeons in New York State, to actually send, le send a letter to the governor. Um, and I, I made the rounds. This makes sense, the hepatitis C bill. Um, I also, unfortunately, the Medical Society of the State of New York and their attorneys, their lobbying efforts, were not giving the governor the right information. And we were gonna have yet another embarrassment with, like with HIV. The Medical Society of the State of New York was misrepresented when it came to HIV testing years ago. It made doctors look like garbage. It really did, like uncaring individuals because they were opposed. Certain folks were opposed who are in Albany don't speak for the, all the doctors in the state. So one of the things that I did was I, I teed this up and in the assembly, except for one vote was yay on this bill. Senate was unanimous. So the summer goes by and we're waiting for the governor. The governor's waiting on this. Governor Cohen's waiting on this. And I started my job in Orange County. We're holding, uh, uh, we rotate in the Low Hudson Valley our immunization conferences. That year, my first year, we were having it in Newburgh. So Dutchess was there, Westchester, Putnam, Rockland. Um, we're all there and um, I get a call. Uh, well, we're at the hotel. The governor and his staff, the AARP, and a few other folks are going to be at a conference call. You will be the only public health official. Do you want to get on and speak to the governor and everyone else? I said, of course I do. I went to my car in the parking lot. I, I, I called into the uh, conference call. I was the only public health official. Everyone spoke and said, well, Dr. Avila, we hear that you're here. You're the commissioner. And the, the governor knows who I am because I did him a lot of favors when I was in PA. He, it turns out he has a lot of friends in a lot of family in PA. So I would always get calls from the, the commissioner saying, hey, can you do this for the governor? Said, of course I can do it. My, my family lives in New York. I'm not going to disrespect the New, York, <laughs> the New York governor. So um, as it turns out, then it was my turn to speak. And I just went down. And I know you have to know when you're dealing with politicians, you have to know what buttons to push and what to say if you want that public health agenda to get through. So I went there and said, look, you're the public health governor. We're so appreciative that you're considering this. I just want to let you know, though, unfortunately, the attorneys for the Medical Society of are not being really honest with you. It's the health commissioners that are going to take the brunt of this. You don't need to be concerned. You're not, it, we don't want the same event that occurred 20 years ago with the HIV bill. So the alarms are going up. Wait a second. Bad press. That's not good. Number two, I said, I know two, and this is true. I know, I would just want you, I know two Republican governors that I've considered right now that I'm consulting, that I've consulted with who are waiting to see what you do, governor. They are, I think you have an opportunity to be the public health governor here in the United States. There are two of them. And they're really on the other side, polar opposites. They want, they're waiting to see what you're going to do, so then they'll do it in their state. You have an opportunity here to really make a difference. And that was it. Guess what? Four days later, signed into law. You waited till the very last day, but you have to know how, what to push, and it's for the greater good. It really is. Now, that being said, that's going to lead to something else. And this was the bill. I put it up there, the Zabrowski bill. Um, these are important dates. And there's a reason why. I want you to notice on the assembly had passed it on 6-10-2013, uh, then the Senate on 6-2013, and then the governor signed it on the 23rd. Well, what's so special about the 23rd, the governor signing it on the 11th? Oh no, it was signed, it was actually signed on the 23rd. What's so special? I told my colleagues, guess what? We're having a real issue with the CDC and the United States Preventive Service Task Force. The CDC was getting beat up. They really wanted a, this type of a bill to occur. It would be the first one in, in the United States. The task force sometimes has some very arrogant folks on that task force, and they were giving it like a C classification. If you have a C classification, if you're familiar with it, 
the insurance companies are probably not going to pay for it. It's not going to get much push. But, but, the, but the fact that this has been signed by the New York State governor, and my, this was my prediction to my friends. Watch, by Monday, it'll be in the papers. They will have changed their mind. We are a voice for the CDC. Because I felt really bad for the CDC. Here they are trying to do the right thing. And, and they're, they're, there's this two federal agencies, basically, are at opposing heads. Who am I going to listen to? I'm going to listen to the CDC. That's who I'm going to really trust. On Monday, New York Times, guess what? It was upgraded to B. The, the task force decided, oh, gee, we're going to look really bad. So let's upgrade it to So this was our way also. This is part of the strategy of helping out the CDC because now we became sort of like lobbyist attorneys for the CDC indirectly. And I felt that I owed Tom Frieden and his wonderful crew to be able to do that because New York was speaking out on this. So there's a sequelae to what you do. Uh, uh, they can have a national effect. Okay, here we go. Fluoridation. CDC has recognized water fluoridation as one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. And you can see right there, there's, a, there's that plaque there in Grand Rapids, which became the first city to fluoridate its water. Then there's also controversy. We want it, we don't want it. Growing up in New York City, I had fluoride in my, in my water. This is the Newburgh water filtration plant. And my staff took me there. And there's a reason why this is important. This is the control room. I enjoy environmental health and in environmental medicine, so I like to see how things are done. This is the entrance. Then there's this famous plaque, because there's a famous study. Now, this plaque was put up there in 19, 1980, but it dates back to the study from, from 1945 to 1955. Now, can someone see why it's important to pay attention in grade, in grammar school and in high school? Look at how they spell the spellings on fluoridation. They're not changing the plaque. Fluoridation? Well, no one's taking it down. It's staying up there. I, 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 I love going by there saying, gee, someone should have, they didn't have spell check, but at least take out a, a dictionary. So um, that being said, that plaque, I took a picture, that's off my iPhone. So that, <laughs> that being said, Here's the paper I'm referring to, and that was when they had Kingston, you know, New York's original capital, and Newburgh had the, that was control, and then Newburgh was the fluoridation. They stopped the study before the full, the full 10 years because the results were wonderful. Every dentist, I think, that who's, who's trained in the United States knows about this study, which is what's so important. Now, we know this in, we know this in public health, right? Now, let me go back. Now, this is the issue that occurred. I get a call from the mayor of Newburgh. It's my first year there. Oh, we're getting toxic fluoride from China. It's poisoned. I'm really afraid of my, my, my engineers pouring it into the treatment facility. Uh, I'm thinking of removing the fluoride. We're going to have a town hall meeting. I said, whoa, whoa, wait a second. First of all, and we're getting tons of emails. I said, oh, I know those emails. I had them in PA, the ferret farm folks. I used to get tortured every night. And I'm, I was in the Secretary of Agriculture. I'm health. At around three or four in the morning, I literally on my phone would get 150 messages several nights a week at that time, as if it's gonna endear me to these folks on how to, to please abolish ferret farms. I have nothing at all to do with ferret farms. I do health, not, not these cute creatures, right? So I said, these are the same, I said, check the emails. They're coming from the same radical group, okay? It's, you're getting a lot of, but it's the same folks. It's not like uh, it's, it's, your, it's, it's your constituents that are really selling this. Number two, you're not getting fluoride from China, which is toxic. That's just not true. Number three, well, I'll call the DEC and make sure, and I'll send my folks also, if you're really concerned someone's going to get hurt and you've been doing it for so many years, for decades, we'll take care of it and we'll review the procedure on how to add the fluoride to the water treatment in, for Newburgh. And then this was the real, because I still saw that, even though it was nice, I wasn't getting anywhere. I said, and what is, what is the town hall meeting? And she gave me the dance. Said, That's great, because I'm going to have Commissioner Shalita Amner, Commissioner Alan Beals from Putnam, and Commissioner Patricia Rupert from Rockland. This around, we're all going to be at the town hall meeting, and we're going to be opposing it. What? What? I said, yeah, we are. We support each other in the Lower Hudson Valley. So I hung up. 
The next day I get a call, you don't need to come. Why don't I need to come? Oh, it's off the table. And this was the other thing that I said to her. The children in Newburgh, I mean, it's the fifth most dangerous city in the United States. I know elected officials who will not go in there unless they're carrying a, their Glocks. That's how, that's how bad the city is, okay? And we had, by my health, my division of community health outreach, we've had sh people shooting at the building. I mean, it's, we have armed security to help our staff, public health staff, get into their cars and go home at night. That being said, we're dealing with a place that's got lead um, because of the old housing, and we've got such poor kids. I said, this is what I, I said to the mayor. I said, do you want to be known as the mayor who removed fluoride from the water when the children, most of them are people, children of color, can't even afford toothpaste and toothbrush. Do you want to be known as the mayor? They got rid of the only thing that could really help them. So by the time they're 40, they die of cardiac disease. Are you going to just wipe this generation out? That's what you have to think about, mayor. Really think about that. Gone, issue gone. You use a bully pulpit. You try to also be nice by saying, let me see how I can help you. But you make people aware of what's at stake, what gener generational repercussions are going to occur. You're empowered in public health. You have numbers. What I love about public health and epidemiology is you can't argue with the numbers. When that P is 0 .001, guess what? Even a judge is going to listen. That's why I've always encouraged my colleagues in law, connect with schools of public health when we're dealing with certain issues. You want to get something known as judicial notice. That means it's so known that this chemical will give you liver cancer or certain leukemia. I don't have to prove it anymore. There's, some, there's a plethora of papers. That's why I really believe public health and the legal community, if you're gonna serve society, should be working together because the more papers that are published by our epidemiologists, the greater the argument is when you go before the judge and go, this is, we consider this a fact. You don't have to prove it because it's a fact because all of you are publishing and doing what's important. Um, and my last slide is Dr. Bruce, Bruce Dixon. He was for 21 years the health commissioner of Allegheny County, which is really Pittsburgh. This gentleman was tall, never got married, restored a mansion, a castle out in Pittsburgh, always wore hush puppies. Same, he, he, they called him like one of the Blues Brothers because he always wore that black tie and usually a black suit. And that other picture is not wearing a black suit. I was told, you need to meet this fellow when I first arrived in Pennsylvania. This is one of the kindest, most gentle, most caring human beings you could ever meet. He was, a, he was an internist, had gotten his MPH. He was doing a great job out in Pennsylvania. And it was always a pleasure. I always had an excuse when I had to go to Pittsburgh to have dinner with him and Cyril Weck, the famous uh, 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 forensic pathologist who's always on TV. Uh, all three of us would just get together and have dinner. But Bruce was amazing because Bruce, on the way to work to the health department, always made about two or three times a week, made it a, a, an issue to find homeless folks and bring them in, and they would have tea or coffee and a meal with him before he went to work. This is what he would do. I remember walking down the streets of Pittsburgh at nighttime after we ate, and I'm going to the garage, and these folks would come up, scary looking folks, and they go, doctor, how are you doing? My, and, and he would know who they were. He knew that it was gonorrhea or syphilis he had treated with these folks, and they were so helpful. Oh, I've got a job. Are you still in rehab? Or he knew these folks just from the street. It was just amazing. And in fact, Tom Frieden came to visit us on my first year in Pittsburgh. It was the, the, the big organization of epidemiologists had its meeting in Pittsburgh. Afterwards, we spent three hours. We all went back to his office. And in the middle of the meeting, he was so dedicated. Excuse me, he told Tom Frieden, who's that director of the CDC, I've got to give some bicillin to some patients that have got syphilis. I'll be right back. He actually left the meeting to treat his patients and then came back and joined us again. This is the kind of human being he was. Now, um, tragically, uh, after I left, I was actually, I, I was the last friend to actually call him. Um, and and uh, I was making arrangements to go visit. I like old mansions that have been restored. And um, I was going to go with my wife and two boys to go visit. And we were making plans. And he got sick. He went to the hospital. They missed an appendicitis, sent them home. So two days later, he ends back in the operating room and dies on the table. And I got the call. 
and this this is a hero of mine. This, there's still YouTube's on. He did simple things like he had videos that were all over Pennsylvania, washing your hands and why you should wash your hands. Simple public health issues that you need to remind the public of. But he actually lived, he walked public health. He's one of my heroes. And he looked up to me and I'm like, I'm just a new guy here. But I looked up to him and I still do for I do to his memory because he embodied what a, a, a practicing public health person should be. And that is to really walk and let the community know, I'm here and I'm concerned about your health and population health. And that's what I have to share with you today. If uh, somebody can turn up the lights, we're going to take a few questions. If you're willing to face this challenging group. I am. I am. It's not the media. I am. <laughs> well, you don't know. Some, of, no, our students, some of our students are with the media. That's right. Sir. Thank you, Doctor. I was uh, interested in your comments about the fracking, and you had to work through the issue of proprietary information. Yes, the gag order from that art, from art, Act 13 that right. you're referring to. Some of the manufacturers of the uh, fracking fluids won't tell you what's exactly in those fluids. So when we get a contaminated patient coming into the emergency room, you talked about working with the EMTs to talk about how to treat the patient in the field, transport them to the hospital. How did that help? Um, that was the only good part of, of Act 13, in that it allowed physicians it got rid of the gag, the gag order. However, it didn't go far enough, which said, and there'll be no liability, and you can get a consult. For example, when I was an ophthalmology resident, I had internists consulting, you know, that inpatient go, go to the hospital and examine their eyes. And when I was an internist, I you remember calling an ophthalmologist or someone else to come in, an orthopedic surgeon, I think we have more of an issue on this patient. You have to be able to talk um, amongst each other. And that was not being dealt with. That was the only positive thing. And I actually wrote an article for the governor on that issue that this freed up the gag order you normally had, but then it went away. So you have to come to that balance. What's in, you're on someone's property. You're, dealing, you're in a certain neighborhood. You need to be able to at least trust the professionals. And then, in, 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 you know, in the legal system, it's called on camera. There's certain things you're not going to let the jury hear. You let the judge hear, and then they decide, okay, that the jury can hear, or that they won't hear. That can be done in these situations. But sometimes people get really greedy. And that's, a, that's still a, a major issue I know in Pennsylvania. But that was the only good part of, and there was a, a, actually a Puerto Rican doctor who sued the governor on this and eventually lost because he didn't have standing because he hadn't shown he had, had the issue come up. You have to have something, has, case has to be ripe, and you have to have standing. You have to show that you've been done some harm or your, or your patient has been done some harm. He didn't have that to prove it. It was all hypothetical. But this is a major concern for the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. I'm going to turn around any additional questions. Take a few minutes. I'm going to use the mic because we're, I believe we're straight. Thank you, Dr. Avila. A lot of the things that you've spoken about, and it was such an arresting uh, conversation, I felt so inspired, are not taught in medical school curricula. Uh, we're not taught how to use the sheer force of character, um, networking. I, I remember specifically the story about the commissioners of public health and how you said, team, uh, Commissioner Show Leader Amra is going to be there, right. the other one's going to be there, we're all going to be there, we're all going to oppose this, and the problem just went away. That's right. So my question is, how do you model this and teach it to the future generations of public health students, medical students, to teach them this, this, this thing? Because I don't really have a name for it. Well, um, I, I mean, it, it, it really is, this, this is health policy. And I always laugh about some of the Ivy League institutions that have health policy departments who basically analyze what people like myself and others do. It's a matter of getting practitioners to teach. I'm available. I'm available to teach. And so are other health commissioners who've been in, who've been in the same position that I've been in. It's a matter of reaching out to those folks who've been out there um, um, 
uh, um, it's what, like Teddy Roosevelt, being the man or the woman in the arena, where you've gotten the dirt and the blood on your face and you've been sweating. And I keep that, by the way, in my office um, because you're going to get hurt along the way. But guess what? You have the value of, of the experience of having lived it so you can really teach it. So it's a matter of getting invited to teach and sharing it with students and future generations. I find it ironic. I haven't been invited once to Mount Sinai. And I'm the only graduate who ever became a state health commissioner. They know it. I'm here. I'm more than happy to help them out. But it's a matter of then reach the academic institutions, reaching out to not someone just like me, the other folks that are out here, to actually welcome them in there and give that practical lecture as part of, of a course. And actually, we see no need to go down to Mount Sinai. We think you're welcome up here. <laughs> so don't even think of it. Is that a follow up question? I was just going to comment. I will uh, think that happened because you were running down to Mount Sinai. I'm a you know, staff member at Mount Sinai. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, and, if, <laughs> thank you. and no need for that. <laughs> Phil and I are still friends. Phil Landrick and I are still friends, just so you know. In fact, when I was invited to the, the uh, there's a special uh, European environmental um, medicine lectures given throughout the world, it was, I was still secretary and I was there. So I shook hands with my old chairman and we were talking. And I'm the one who got, gave him the information. Guess what? I got the special news from DC because I had that special bat phone that the Affordable Care Act had just passed. So they found out right away, and he was so delighted that I was the one to let him know. And he made the announcement at the end to, to all the, uh, the the public health folks that were over at uh, at Mount Sinai in one of their uh, in one of their classrooms. Right. For the record, mm -hmm. when I joke about Mount Sinai, Phil and I worked for years together at the CDC, and then for many years after at the FDA. So uh, and Phil has been a lecturer here in this very room. He's wonderful. Because of him, we finally affected the OSHA Act. And we only bought it to 10 deciliters per, per, uh, uh, per, per, per uh, I guess, is it, is it 10 milligram, 10 milligrams per deciliter, micrograms per deciliter for lead, for lead. And it's got to be a lot less for kids. But he made that. And, and it's, a five, it's fine. It's got to even be less than that. I've got all, he gave me a stack of all the testimony he presented before Congress. And his main issue is, we're going to be a nation of two digit IQs. Our national security is gone. And the clincher was, this is how much money we're gonna lose in the United States. And that's what sold Congress. And that's something that you don't always learn in, 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 when you're studying for your MPH, because the lawmakers, they understand money. Yeah, we also worked on the great Herbert Neal campaign. Anybody oh, yes. Reading about blood lead and lead poisoning, uh, Herbert Neal, beautiful. Thank you. Um, Dr. Adler, going back a little bit and speaking with health policy. Um, in your bio, Leonora had mentioned that you were currently working on legislation, which pretty much collaborates, I believe it was, uh, primary care uh, with public health and legislation. I've done a lot of things when it comes to certain, with issues of primary care. Recently, what I've been doing is the following. And that is, and this is, I was a correction surgeon for a number of years between my internal medicine residency and ophthalmology. I ran a maximum security, the worst prison in New York City. I ran from 1988 to 89. And um, one of the things that I became aware of is whenever there's an active shooter situation, doctors are not allowed in to the warmer hot zones. California's figured it out, Georgia's figured it out, New York is way behind. And that means that the unique doctors who actually become peace officers. Now, how do doctors become peace officers? They have to be classified in, in the New York, New York State CPL 2.10. They don't have doctors there. Prior to that, health prior to 1980, health commissioners were first thought of as, as peace officers in 1908. So one of the things that I have I've done is I, I Kemp Hannon, who's the chairman of the Senate uh, Health Committee in New York said, you know, Dr. Avila, there is someone up in Niagara Falls that's working on it, one of the Republican senators. So I went up, all the way up to Niagara Falls, met with the senator. Uh, senator Orr, I think. That is correct, Senator Orr. And I said, you know what you need is you need someone in the assembly. You're, you're, you're a Republican. I'm going to find you the most liberal Democrat in New York City, which I did. And I sat down with this Yale graduate from Spanish Harlem and said, this is the right thing. I want you to work. And they both asked me to write the bill and I wrote it. And this, after the budget's done, I had to wait a year because it happened two weeks before the, the legislature went on their break last summer. We're gonna hopefully have that bill where if you're a sheriff 
or a, or a, or a municipal police chief, you can actually recruit an MD, a paramedic, an EMT, send them to, uh, to peace officer training, and then incorporate them in your SWAT team. I have many colleagues in California who are doctors and deputy sheriffs. They get the job, they save lives. I've got a companion. In fact, my thesis at Harvard was on this. Um, and I presented it to the director of the Secret Service on graduation day. It makes sense. Hopefully we're gonna have that happen. That's one thing I've been working on this year. And then the other thing is the homologs, for expedited scheduling. New York needs to appoint the New York State Department of Health Commissioner, the Department of Health Commissioner to be the scheduler of drugs. Right now, the way you get a drug um, schedule is someone from the Assembly of the Senate talks about it. That could take years. Every other day they're coming up, changing the molecular structure by only a little bit. And that's what I did in Pennsylvania. It's, it's a no brainer and it's constitutional. What you do then is you appoint the commissioner, the state level. So the police chiefs, the DAs who've got current cases, like, this is the drug. It changed on this carbon circle, right? This one element was changed. It's a homolog. It's still gonna have the same addictive properties. Then you just schedule it. 18 months later, it'll be put in the books officially. But if you do the expedited scheduling, you don't kick the case out. Judges are forced to throw the cases out. This is why when we had that issue last summer in Brooklyn, where tw was it 20 some odd people were out on the street in Brooklyn, um, when they asked, they interviewed the police, well, why aren't you arrested? Because the cases were kicked out. They were saying it. And that's something that, and you know, the irony is, I was asked to do this in 2011. I picked one lawyer, Michael Siegman's his name. We both said, we wrote the, we, we wrote, we wrote the law. It got lost with my governor. Last summer, I gave a talk with the DA in Orange County and the sheriff. And I happened to mention that I had written this law and it went nowhere. The New York State DA's Association approached me about it. So then I called my old department PA, my legislative director, who's legendary there, he's been there through many administrations, said, he said, guess what, doctor? It's law here in Pennsylvania. I said, well, how did that happen? He got buried. He was buried in the attorney general's office because it's the who's more macho type thing that was going on. Uh, he got lost. Saving lives got lost. He said, well, you know the new governor, who's a Democrat, I'm friends with him. So I dug up your old law, and I showed it to him. And Governor Wolf said, this is fantastic. We're going to make it law. And he signed it on June 6th of last year, June 8th of last year. It became the law of Pennsylvania. So that, I took that, I, and, I, and I, when I printed it, I could see in bold print all the modifications. It's what I had written. I even, I, even judges can't over, overrule this. So what I did was I took a trip up to um, Albany. I found a senator who's working on it. And I said, you don't need to, I introduced myself. I said, you don't need to redo the law. Here, cut and paste. I did it in Pennsylvania. My staff, this is the law of Pennsylvania. Modify, and by the way, also, you've got to get the commissioner to be the, uh, the, the scheduler for the state. That's, those are the only two steps. Make him the scheduler and cut and paste the law that I wrote. It's all there. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. He was just shocked. He was absolutely shocked, the senator who's working on this. So that's another thing that I'm working on uh, at this point. Great questions, great answers. We'll also point out that our own faculty member, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Riley, who runs our Center for Disaster Medicine, was about to find out. He doesn't know yet because he was out this week. He's about to get a half million dollar grant uh, to help run that center from New York State. And one of his big issues also has been this deputizing of healthcare providers, physicians, EMTs, and so forth, so that when law enforcement go, up, go out and there are health issues, they have somebody who's already deputized who can be part of that uh, response. Uh, it's time to move on because Dr. Avila has another great engagement over on the other side of campus, but before he goes, as Gomer Pyle used to say, surprise, surprise. <laughs> oh. He knows I like wearing my cap. What did you be? Fantastic. I, I love it, it. I think if he fits the current.